and some examples of the kind of R&D we do in the Honeynet project. And uh, it's going to be quite a, a quick, broad set of information. <coughs> Hopefully, I'm covering quite a lot of information. The URLs, everything I'm talking about, is at the bottom of the slides. The slides are available publicly. So if you have any questions, if you want more information, please do get in touch. So quick background about me. I'm from the UK. I run the UK chapter. I'm also uh, one of the Honeynet Project's board of directors, and I'm our chief research officer. Basically, I'm the infrastructure guy. I build network, service, firewalls. Been in that for many years. Uh, I'm also part of the Shadow Server Foundation, and I'm also the Honeynet Project's GSOC uh, administrator. And my day job is for an open source software consultancy in the UK for Isotoma. So, over the last 10 years, we've been building a whole bunch of Honeynet technologies. Hopefully, you're familiar with some of these concepts. We're not going to go into much detail here in this presentation, but the idea of honeypots, computers that are set up to be attacked to capture information, honeynets, which are networks of honeypots. We talk about interaction, how much interaction the attacker has with the honeypot. Is it an emulated system? Is it a real OS? We divide the honeypots into research or production. And over the years, we've evolved a whole set of tools for capturing data and controlling data. And our technology has changed as well. We've gone from server-side honeypots, attacks against computers, to client-side honeypots, going out to the internet and looking for malware. And then, as malware has become more prolific, we've been building systems for automated malware analysis too. So if you want to learn more about our basic technologies, our approaches, we have a, a book called uh, Know Your Enemy. It's uh, written by Honeynet Project members. And we also have another book by two of our members called Virtual Honeypots. They're a good introduction. It's worth a read. So if you're looking for a background, that's where to start. So I mentioned tools. We have a whole set of honeypot tools. Uh, if you want to find uh, web honeypots, client honeypots, they're all available. The URL is at the bottom of the page. If you want to download those tools and test them, you can find them all on our pages there. I'm not going to spend much time talking about historic tools. Maybe you know them already. Instead, I'm going to focus on new tools and what we've been working on in the last few years. We aren't the only people building Honeypot tools. You can get tools such as uh, Argos, uh, MWFD, Honeyfind from external people as well. Um, some of our members are involved in these projects too, like Gail at the back. Um, if you want a summary of most of the tools from the last sort of eight, ten years, there's a paper we wrote uh, two years ago, which is um, from a European workshop that summarizes the tools, and also the kinds of Honeypot deployments we're doing as well. So our members maybe do single honeypots, one honeypot on a local network. They do regional groups working together. They work in international projects. And the biggest projects we deploy are things like a, a global distributed honeynet. This is one of my pet subjects. We're building virtual networks of honeypots on one site with one physical computer and many virtual machines. And then we scale that up internationally. There are honeypots all around the world, sending data to a central location where members can do analysis or get instance. So hopefully, if you go and look at the papers reference, you can see how Honeypot technology has developed, how it's scaled, how it's been used all around the world. So I'm going to talk about new technology. What we've been doing in the last two years, particularly Google some of the code and some of the new initiatives you might not have heard of. So we started in Google some of the code in 2009. This is a three-month project where students are funded by Google for four and a half thousand US dollars to work on software development projects. There were 150 organizations involved, uh, we were one of them, and we had uh, nine funded presidents for our students. We also paid for three more ourselves using our own budget, which we called the Honey X Summer of Code. We're trying to do that to support additional student projects. Mostly PhD students, some were our early members, some were new students we hadn't met before. And if you want to see more on those projects, the URL is at the bottom of the page. We have quite a mix of projects. Some are updates to existing tools, so Phony C, a client honeypot, a Capture, Nebula, Bigfish, and some are new tools, so low interaction server honeypots, uh, web app honeypots, hardware virtualization, different types of hybridization, and some data analysis and management tools as well. This is the best diagram of the day. Just to remind you, a honeypot, so a server honeypot, the bad guys come to a honeypot, they just sits and waits. It's pretty simple. So probably the most popular low interaction server honeypot is Nepenthes. This is written by some of the German members, the guys at the back. And uh, you can download it from the URL at the bottom of the page. This is really a first generation. When you point people out like that, make sure they raise their hands. Yeah. The so German guys, raise your hands. Come on, all of you. Tell me you gotta raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> so because I'm 
talking about old technology, the guys are saying, no, we don't want to be associated with old technology. We like the new stuff. <laughs> or other people's technology. So this was a first generation Honeypot. Um, it's signature based. You have to write modules to emulate vulnerabilities. So you can't patch a zero day with Nepenthes. If you ever tried to write a module for it, it's C++, it's pretty difficult. It took quite a long time. When uh, MS-0867, the conflict of vulnerability, came out, it took about two weeks to write a module for that. So we didn't see the attack for the first two weeks. It's still widely used. Uh, AV vendors, universities, companies all deploy it. And it's often used for automated uploading of malware. Groups like Shadow Server use this. So you have networks of honeypots all around the world. You correct malware. You put it into a central sandbox. You execute the binary samples on a sandbox. You analyze what the binary does. You put it into a tracking system. You record the data. So our replacement for Nepenthes is called a Dianea. And this is a second generation low interaction uh, server honeypot. So the goal here was to start from scratch, take the lessons we learned, and build the ability to capture new attacks. We want to dynamically detect new attacks, uh, different methods we haven't seen before. To do that, we need a better awareness of the protocol. Also, we want to make it much easier for people to get involved and write their own vulnerabilities modules as well. So using a scripting language rather than C++. And then we wanted to try and be able to detect shellcode generically using some techniques we developed over the last few years. This in particular uses a library called a libemu. This is an x86 emulation. Um, we're running in a small library, it can detect the presence of shellcode. So Dianea was developed in GSOC. It uses common libraries like libevent for scalability. Um, it uses Python as an embedding scripted language to develop vulnerability modules. It already spots IPv6 out of the box, so you can run uh, IPv6 honeypots. And in particular, it has a implementation of the SMB uh, network stack that was written by Mark Schroeser at the back. Mark, raise your hand. So congratulations from Mark. Thank this you. means if somebody connects your honeypot on port 445 and makes an RPC call, we can understand what the protocol is intended to be used. This is a change from the Pentees. And then using Libemu, again for the Germans, um, this can detect shellcode generically and perform actions against it. So if you've ever seen the Pentees, uh, vulnerability modules are quite robust in C++. This is a module in uh, Dianea. It's Python, it's a few classes, it's quite simple. <laughs> The output coming from the honeypot is much better as well. You get an entire transaction history. In this case, somebody connecting to port 445, they're making an SMB connection, making an RPC call, we're emulating the protocol, we're getting the OS fingerprint, we're seeing that it's opening a remote shell, it's attempting to spawn an FTP connection, and it's downloading a binary. And this is a completely unknown attack. We didn't know what was going to happen beforehand, but we're emulating the entire stack. If you've used the Nepenthes, the output was very robust, but not very easy to work with. This has a SQL interface. You can write SQL queries, you can find top attackers, those kind of things. That's pretty useful. So this is Dianea. It's a low interaction honeypot. You will also download it. And it's pretty well documented. It's now a replacement for Nepenthes. So if you're running low interaction honeypots, this is our preferred tool today. On the high interaction side, this is the full OS. We have a tool called CBEC. This was developed uh, in the last 10 years. It uses rootkit-style techniques. You install a software client on the OS. It covertly exports the IOAX and the attacker to your system where you can analyze it. The idea is, if you read the slide, somebody types, you see their keystrokes. If they download a file, you capture that file as well. There's more papers linked on the slides. We built a Honeywall UI. This is a web-based interface to our high-interaction honeybox. You can take the data from CBEC and build attack traces, so you can see the tree of activity as the attacker uses your honeypot. 